David Grossman är en av Israels mest internationellt kända författare och en mycket tongivande röst i Israel-Palestina-konflikten. Han är flitigt översatt och flerfaldigt prisbelönt. Och I förra veckan så fick han motta ännu ett pris, Bärmanpriset, för sin senaste roman Med mig leker livet. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. It's a privilege to have you here, and I have to start with saying congratulations to the uh, literature prize that you received, the Berman Prize, Berman Prize. Yeah, thank you. It's a very nice and generous, and for me important prize. And it was especially for your novel in Swedish, is Med mig leker livet. How would you uh, say it in your language? In Hebrew, it's "Iti uh, ha'chaim esachek arbe." With me, life plays a lot. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, uh, the formal, correct Hebrew. It's a broken sentence because it was spoken by a broken person, and uh, the people who came to Israel after the Shoah and after the Second World War, they were refugees, uh, tormented people, broken people. And the Hebrew that they spoke was not the correct, the formal Hebrew that uh, we, the, the, the children that were born after the, the Shoah and the, and the Second World War, that we spoke. And we were all the time a little embarrassed by the way our parents spoke mm -hmm. and ashamed. And we tried to buffer between our friends and our parents that they will not know that our parents speak this shameful language. And I think that... Part of the reactions to this book in Israel was that it legitimized this kind of dialect of broken Hebrew. Mm. I will come back to your upbringing and background because it's uh, an important thing in your writing, of course, and in your novels. But I would start with this because it's... Uh, it's really interesting because this is a true story, based on a true story. And you get a phone call from a woman, very old woman, 90 years old. No, she was then she was 77 years old. Oh, okay, 77, but yeah. old. Very young. Very young, <laughs> 77. But yeah. her name was Eva Pantic. Eva Pantic, yeah. And she called you, you didn't know her. No, but Israel is a very straightforward country. Everybody can call you and tell you from whom you were inspired or from whom you stole and things like that. And she called and she said, uh, she said my name in a very strong intonation, you know, David. Mm. Like immediately I felt guilty of something. Mm. She had the intonation of our legendary first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion. Yeah. David. And then we started to speak and... Uh, I, from the very beginning, I, I felt that she is a very unique human being. Now, everyone is unique, as you know, but uh, Eva Panic was unique in a uniquer way, in a very, very special way. First of all, her accent was a mixture of Serbian, Croatian, Hungarian and Hebrew, not a, a common accent. And second, her life story was so extreme, so hard to believe almost, that I was immediately magneted to it. And she told me on this very first conversation, she told me some things about her past, her biography. And then at a certain point where I was the most tensed and to know what is the, what's going to happen, she said, oh, maybe I'm burdening you with my boring stories, but may I call you again in the future and we shall chat a little? And I said, yes, please do. And the future came in two days. She called me again yeah. and we chatted a little. And then again, at the most pivotal moment, she just said, but now I think you are tired. You don't have to listen to the memories of an old lady. And I said, no, no, no. I understand now your method, the Shahrazad method. You know, the, the right moment you cut off and vanish from my life for some days. I want to hear your story, I told her. And she said, will you write my story? And I immediately said, you know, Eva, first of all, I... Usually I cannot decide now what I will write in the future. The story has to come and to, to grab me, you know, like an eagle is grabbing a lamb. And, and only when the book is inevitable, then I will write it. And second, I, I will not document you one-to-one -one exactly as you are. I'm not a documentarist. I am a documentarist, but I prefer so much writing fiction. And uh, I said, I will have to describe you, but also... Also to imagine you and to fantasize you and to invent you. 
but I, I promise you one thing, I will not impose on you something that is not natural and relevant for you. And she said, yes, of course, you are the artist, of course. So, so, so it started, we were very good friends for 20 years, mm -hmm. the last 20 years of her life, until she died at the age of 97. Uh, many meetings, many phone calls, getting used to her way of telling stories, to her silences, and getting used to the very dramatic and extreme story that she had to tell. And in the novel, uh, Vera is a person that resembles her very much. And, and the novel starts with a very nice party to celebrate Vera's 90th birthday. Yes. And there are grandchildren that are, you know, telling about her life, a kind of a play is seen. And, and from the outside, it looks like she's a very loved grandmother, mother, uh, or uh, people just love her. And then you sort of get into the story and then you kind of get a totally different picture of three women so, uh, which are in focus in the story. Yes, uh, the story is about these three women. It's uh, Eva, Vera in my book, Nina, her daughter, and Gilly, the daughter of the daughter. Three strong persons who are sharing together a wound, a deep wound that has not been spoken about in a clear, straightforward way, and it tortures the whole family. Uh, and in this birthday, the 90th birthday to Vera, uh, her daughter Nina, who is now 60 years old, have a request. She wants her mother and her daughter to come with her to the island of Goli Otok, the Croatian uh, island, where the whole story actually began, where the wound has been created and continued to, th to darken the life of these three women. And the story is about the, the trip and about what happened between Vera and Nina and her daughter Nina and Gilly, how they abandoned uh, each other, how they really scarred the life of each other, and they really try to find a way to go back to each other, reluctantly, suspiciously, and yet to go back to each other. Mm. Uh, there, there is a moment in the story where Gilly, the, the, the youngest of all, who really deeply hates her mother, Nina, because her mother abandoned her. And suddenly she sees Nina in her weakness, in her fragility, vulnerability. And she said, for a second I didn't hate her. And then she's taken aback and she said, what am I, who am I without the hatred of Nina? All, all her being is created around this hatred. And I thought, how many of us, our personality, our being is built around such terrible quality like suspicion or hatred or revenge. It's very popular, I think. And how we become prisoners of this terrible characteristic and we, we, we are trapped, we are victims of our, our own hatred. Mm -hmm. And what kind of life is that? Because there are a lot of questions and a lot of courage. I would describe this because it's a complicated story that it's understanding. They kind of, through this journey or this trip, they start to understand, not forgiveness, but understanding. Is that what you could say? Yes, yes. Forgiveness might be a very vague uh, mm. uh, word. And, and first of all, I believe we can forgive and yet remember what was done to us, the injustice that has been done to us. It's very hard to ask someone to give up on a terrible, unjust trauma that he or she went through. But if you find a way to be more flexible around this uh, stiff point in you, in your soul, of the injustice that have been done to you, if you can see things a little differently, uh, then even the trauma becomes more bearable and you learn to live with it and you learn to live with it with the person who inflicted you this trauma. And I, I think this is the thing I studied and learned the most from 
their story, the story of the, the three women, is the ability to reconcile, not to forget, it's always there, the pain, the, the humiliation of what each, each of them have gone through. And yet they found a way to, to coexist, to live together with it, to talk about it, to ask questions about it in a very flexible and dynamic way. And I, I thought it has to do a lot with the, the fact that when they did the trip to Goli Otok, they retold the old story in, in new words. Uh, and, and usually in my books, there are people who are telling their story to someone who is listening, to a good listener, an attentive listener. Uh, and when you have a good listener, maybe you stop being the victim of your formal story, mm. formal version. But I also, when I read the novel and I listened to your speech, thought about the conflict between Israel and Palestine, because it's like a metaphor. Is it possible to understand and to reconcile? Yes, I believe deeply that it's possible. Maybe not for many years it will be possible, but right now still for some time there is a window of opportunity that is still opened. Uh, and I, I think it's so important that we and the Palestinians, we the Israelis and the Palestinians, we listen to each other. You know, they speak all the time, the, the experts, about the Israeli narrative, how it clashes into the Palestinian narrative. I hate the word narrative. I, I think that narrative is, is a human story that has congealed, that has fossilized. And, and what I try to do in all my books that I wrote about the conflict, all the books that I wrote, all the books I wrote for uh, about family matters. There are some narratives within a family between parents and children. There are sometimes contradictory narratives, and I believe that if we are telling the old stories in new words, we are massaging. We make a massage. We are massages of this uh, frozen story, and we can even allow the narrative or the story of our enemy to infiltrate into our own internal political organs. It will not demolish us, it will not reduce our hold of our identity. It will only make our approach to the conflict more realistic, less uh, a projection of our nightmares or wishful thinking. Reality will become more realistic and we shall be more flexible in our attitude towards the people who are now our enemy. Uh, we shall allow ourselves to look at the conflict also from their point of view. Mm. And if you do it, and it's, I think it's a, it's a good advice, advice even for a couple who are arguing about something, if you allow yourself to see the, the, the place of the argument from the point of view of the other person or the other people, suddenly things change. Suddenly you are in a different place. Suddenly you are... You're even softer in, in, in the way you approach the, the enemy. Have you reached Palestinians, for example, with your novels? Have you got reactions from them? Because this is kind of a theme in your novels. Yeah, I, my, I think four of my books have been translated to Arabic mm -hmm. uh, and published and distributed in the Arab world. Uh, and uh, one thing I remember very, one reaction I remember very vividly, someone wrote about my book To the End of the Land, which is also about the, the Israel-Palestinian conflict from the point of view of one family, one Israeli family. And somebody, a, a professor for literature, wrote in, in a paper, uh, when, I, when I read this, and he's an Arab, Arab person, he said, when I read it, I suddenly realized that even the Jewish mother is worried for her son and loving her son. Now, for, of course, for us, it's a taken for granted. But there are parts in the Arab world that are so brainwashed against Israel and so demonizing us that they do not allow themselves to look at our story as a legitimate, humane, vulnerable story. So with the reaction of this person, I suddenly understood that you know, stories can create a change, a small change. It's not that they're going to change the whole world, but it can make some people look at reality in a more nuanced way. Uh, I mean, if, if there is something that I can 
ask big people is to insist on nuances, especially mm-hmm. when you live in a reality of conflict, because the reality of conflict make you very tough and obtuse and belligerent. And you, you miss so many elements uh, of, of, of reality that you, you are unable to set yourself free from it. Mm. Like in the story, in the novel. Exactly. But there are so many parents, for instance, have lost their children in the war, and you did too. You lost your son. Yeah. And with that in your heart, it's sometimes very hard to think about reconciliation or, or forgiveness. It is hard. Uh, my, my reactions are, I think, understandable. We lost uh, Uri, our son, 15 years ago in the war between Israel and the Hezbollah in 2006. And part of me is always there. Uh, and I, at the beginning, it was really unbearable. It was impossible to think how to continue life. Even staying alive was not taken for granted. Everything was questioned again. But I, would, I don't want to stay in this place. I don't want to, to collaborate with hatred and with vengefulness. Uh, and uh, I don't want other families, Israelis or Palestinians, to go through what we are, my family, mm. are going through. What do you mean that you saw a bit of light, an opportunity right now in the conflict? What do you uh, see right now? First of all, I think a, a good development is that Mr. Netanyahu is no more mm. prime minister. He is a very talented person in many ways. He's charismatic and very ultimately man- manipulative. Uh, but uh, his approach did not do good to Israel. Right now we have another prime minister who is much more uh, of a, a myth of a prime minister like Netanyahu was, but he is a very opinionated, practical person who came to work. You know, just in a very practical, straightforward way, he came to work. Uh, and the atmosphere, atmosphere suddenly was cleared. In, 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 in some weeks it was cleared. The problem is that in order to hold his uh, coalition together, Mr. Bennett, the new prime minister, has to make a lot of compromises. And the most important problem of Israel, which is the occupation of the Palestinians, will not be dealt with. This is the agreement between the different parties that join this coalition. So we shall have some industrial uh, silence for some time, some relaxation. Yet there is not time, there is not enough time. We must end this conflict because unless, until we we solve this, this conflict, we in Israel will not feel at home and the Palestinians will not have their home. And since the whole idea of creating Israel was that at last we shall have a home in the world, because for thousands of years of history, we never felt at home in the world. And Israel is meant to be this home and it should be. And some huge miracles have been created there. We created their culture and agriculture and industry and high tech. And even this army that we like to criticize so much, but without this army, we would not have survived in the Middle East one one hour even. So what I wish is that there will be a process, a dialogue, exchange of opinions, a melting of the, the deadlock of the situation. So we shall arrive at the inevitable situation that both sides know exactly what it is, what will be the solution, where will go the the border between the two states, and then we shall have a home. And having a home will be the beginning of the recovery of us from thousands of years of tragic history. I have to stop (laughs) the interview now, and I would love to listen to you uh, for a longer time, but it's... Mm. It's time to end this interview. But the book uh, is all about this, how human beings have possibilities. Maybe we don't even know about them. But this is what you're telling in this fantastic story. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. Thank you so much for coming here.